My name is Michael Davis, and I am here to call bullshit. The open source security is based on the concept that the source code is open, available, that numerous programmers around the world are reviewing your code and letting you know about the vulnerabilities in it. Bullshit. First, a word from my sponsor. Uh, they won't even claim the body. I am here because I believe in the open source movement, open source software. I am here because I believed blindly. I ignored my education and my experience, and I believed. I had a customer ask me, oops, let me know if you can't hear me, because I'm bouncing around. <clears throat> I had a customer ask me for a recommendation on a tool to sanitize hard disks so they turn computers in. I said, there's a great open source tool out there Derek's boot and nuke, D-Ban. said, can I trust it? I don't know. How will I know? <clears throat> we said we would look at the software and make a recommendation on whether we could trust it or not. And so we took on the task to review software for D-Ban and other open source solutions um, and make a recommendation on whether it could be trusted or not, what kind of review had been done. We couldn't find any evidence of any reviews for DBAN or the other tools that we had found. One of the primary hurdles we faced in doing our review was a lack of developer documentation. What we found was high-level functional description, why you'd want to use this program, and in most cases, commented source code, and nothing else. So essentially, if you're trying to understand the program, you have to really understand the program. So I'm here, there are a lot of reasons why we need to review open source security solutions. I'm here focused today to talk about the lack of de uh, developer documentation and why we need it and who can benefit from that. Um, and I'll talk about two different communities who need that kind of information. Um, after presenting some benefits and hopefully getting some buy-in, I want to discuss the difference between functional, which is what most people look at when they talk about security, versus assurance, confidence in what's being done. I'm going to use a model. I am not endorsing common criteria. I am just using the assurance piece of it as a model to discuss how to gain confidence in an open source security solution. Then I'll be focusing on the development piece in depth. What I see as a path ahead and my limited view of the path ahead, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, first thing, uh, confessions. The title of the presentation was meant to antagonize, to draw the crowd. For a Sunday afternoon, I think I got it. <laughs> um, as I said, I am a believer in open source. I use the solutions when I can. I recommend them when they can. I was just challenged and uh, wanted to share my frustrations. One of the things that seems obvious, but maybe not so obvious, is just because the source code is available does not mean it's being looked at. In some cases, this is true. In some cases, what's being, what people think is being looked at is just a spotty, not comprehensive look for exploits or vulnerabilities that can be exploited, ignoring other vulnerabilities that could be exploited but were more difficult to develop. So we need to appreciate that there's a difference between just having the source code available and actually having someone look at it, preferably someone other than the person who wrote it. And there's some challenges to that. A uh, recent survey of what's on SourceForge showed that about 98% of the software out there has one or two developers on it. And I'll highlight an issue with that later on. This problem, not documenting how you develop the software, is not an open source problem. It is a software development problem. It doesn't matter whether you're commercial or open source, you face the same issues, you just have some abilities to solve them different ways. Um, I'll tell you up front, I think the open source community may address this faster than the commercial world can, simply because of our willingness to share lessons learned, the pain we felt, and try to have other people not experience that same pain. <coughs> Soft, yes. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. Okay. And that is one of the things I'll highlight again later in the presentation. But commercial software, the schedule's primarily driven by a marketing schedule. It's a business decision when to ship, not a technical decision. This is different than the open source community, which tends to ship when they think it's ready. Um, a, a different philosophy, different pressures, uh, different motivations. And uh, software lifecycle. We need to respect that software is never done, just shipped or posted. Um, it is a continuous process to improve that software. The other thing that maybe not that isn't appreciated, and this is going back to the one or two developers on a team, is the development teams have life cycles of their own. On larger teams, you'll see people come in and then roll off. And so we need to look at that transition. Most of the mistakes that are in software were not put there deliberately. They're screw-ups, all shits. Whatever you want to use, they're there because someone wasn't thinking at that moment about that particular issue. You'll also find where we discover new vulnerabilities that we didn't really think about when we were doing um, reviews beforehand. So a review five years ago might not have thought about looking for integer overflow situations where if you're doing that today, you might do that. Maybe you should. <laughs> Repeating again, the status quo for most of the open source projects is a high level functional description. Why you want to use the software and then it's comments of varying qualities in the code itself. There is typically no supporting documentation in between except for the occasional user guide. Uh, there are some exceptions. Um, Mozilla is probably the, you know, one of the best that I can point to. It's, I mean, it's a larger team, obviously, so I'm somewhat cheating. Um, but they have a, a site developed, dedicated to developer documentation and cover it so you can kind of wade yourself in. Um, not suggesting that all projects need that level. Um, the other one I heard today was Tor, um, which was interesting because uh, the Onion Router or Routing, I can't remember what the R was specifically, um, they have design documentation and that documentation allowed the porting from Tor, which I think is written in C, to be written in Java over in Germany, the, the JAP group, I forget what the acronym stands for. Why do we want to do developer documentation? There are two distinct groups who need this documentation. The first is development teams themselves. And it's kind of hard when you're doing the solution yourself to think that you need documentation for yourself. But if you go back to my point about the teams grow, people roll in, roll off as they have different needs. Um, the, you can see that having information about design decisions recorded somewhere would be extremely useful. If you um, have development documentation, you lower the bar for project participation. You can bring more people in because they can understand what your tool does and how it works easier. Um, I have to put out a word of caution. I was introduced to a term that I had not seen before. It's a concept known as a net negative programmer. Um, and that basically means that <laughs> At the end of the day, this individual has done more damage than good, no matter how many times you sit with them. So you want to, be, you want to lower the bar, but you can't do it uh, blindly. Um, in that development doc, uh, documentation, you're going to communicate design decisions. Uh, one of the more important things that you might not intuitively think to document is the alternatives that were considered but not implemented because this, come, this becomes very good down the line when someone says, oh, I have a great idea, let's do it this way. If that path was previously explored, you have a record, and if the team members have changed, you're able to see that. Those benefits all benefit the team that is developing the open source software. There's another group who's interested in looking at this software, and those who are trying to say, yes, we can trust it. Not just, for what it, not just the function, but we can trust it. We need to gain confidence that if it says it does A, it does A, but we also need to gain confidence that it doesn't do B when it's not supposed to. And that's a much more difficult task. Uh, it is not a trivial task. It is, well, never mind. Yeah, I think I'm speaking to the choir on that point. <clears throat> we need to separate two concepts which may or may not uh, be well understood. One is, what is a functional requirement versus an assurance requirement? A functional requirement is, this is what it does. 
it does not imply any confidence in how much we should believe that it's going to continue doing that this is contrasted with an assurance requirement that says this is how i can show that you should have confidence it's going to do whatever i said it was going to do yes depends on your model um there are assurance requirements that cause functional requirements to be created um in the common criteria model i guess that's the easiest way to say um you can have from my perspective it's easier to separate the two mentally is i want to talk about what it does and then i want to talk about what i'm going to do to give people confidence it does that and doesn't do anything else as i said this is not an endorsement for common criteria it's a model i'm familiar with um they have uh, a vocabulary to define what the thing does they have a vocabulary to describe what assurance requirements are there they have a methodology for evaluating um someone who says this is what i want to build and for um someone who says i built this the only piece that i'm grabbing right now is and i'll caveat it most of the assurance requirements and the reason i'm grabbing that is just to have a model we can look at the majority of the assurance requirements are the ones here and i'm the one i'm skipping is the concept of assurance maintenance which um is a bit overwhelming at this point and so we'll look at configuration management delivery and operation development guidance documents life cycle support tests and vulnerability assessment my focus again is on development and developer documentation um and what i'll try to do is point out for each one of these how we in the community have tried to solve the particular aspect um and the only one i'm going to talk about a little more in depth is the development configuration management um oh vocabulary first the definitions that i'm i'm grabbing here come right out of common criteria and you're going to need to know three definitions as we go through this the first one's toe target of evaluation just read that as your software because that would probably be the correct answer when you see toe security function that just means the security functions that your software does uh and that's differentiated from other functions and if you see st that security target and that's just the statement of what is about your software for configuration management and managing the versioning the changes that are made to open source software the de facto standard is cvs um that seems to be one area where we get it um we have versioning control we have a way to control who can make changes um we seem to be on track with this one delivery and operation this deals with having your software go out get installed and come up and operating in the way that you thought it would come up and operate um right now the software is typically distributed from a website uh the concern you could have is that the software could be swapped out compromised etc the way a lot of organizations have dealt with that is they pull the software down to a mirror and um then they wait a few days because um people care about the software if your web server that was providing software got uh trojaned you'll know about it rather quickly the word will get out if they see that they know that their internal copies got uh yes okay the um issue with md5 is it is just the um hash okay with the with pgp you actually have someone signing the hash so if i'm going to if you have a uh, software on a website i'm going to put my trojan software and my trojan md5 up there <laughs> okay you can see the difference some people don't even have the md5s up there um from my level md5 provides a low level of assurance you you have some confidence it hasn't been compromised but not a great deal you know that if it was compromised where it was compromised the web server is providing you the signature and the software um with pgp it's a little bit higher but it's a whole big area to get into um and uh, i do not see a lot of widespread use of digital signatures to uh, assert that the code is correct and came from who it was supposed to um development this is the area that i'm going to want to focus on and the area where we have i'll use the term the least documentation 
Because what we need to start with, in theory, is a high-level description of what we want. That's going to be turned into requirements secure that get turned into security functions. That's the TOS, uh, TSF. And then we're going to take those requirements. We're going to design some software based on modules or uh, some sort of uh, subgrouping. And we're going to explain how, as we go down each level, all the way until we get to the source code, where that function is being handled. Um, and so you can see right now we have high-level functional description and source code. Um, without really getting to know the code, you're having to jump from the top to the bottom. Or more specifically, you're starting at the bottom, and then you'll under once you understand the code, you'll understand how they implemented that high-level function they're describing. Guidance documents. Um, that's a variety of guidance documents that are out there. Uh, in general, uh, user documents are, are common. Uh, administrator documents, common. And then some organizations have uh, technical user. Some projects have um, additional ones. And this is just, uh, I use the term use documentation, how to run the uh, um, software. Lifecycle support. Uh, it says ad, ad hoc, but if you look in the middle of the paragraph, you'll see flaw remediation. Um, that is one area where you cannot argue that the open source community has a real advantage because when a vulnerability is identified, the ability to pull people in, especially if you say help, has no parallel in the commercial world. Um, so um, that is one area where we do have an advantage, and it depends on the size of the project is your ability to pull things in. Um, yes? That, and that's the key issue, should they choose to uh, use them? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Testing, uh, you, you can argue this both ways. You could say that we release the software, we let it to run, we allow people to feedback when it doesn't work, and that's our test model. Um, the, you, you may have some org projects that are extremely well organized and they define test cases and every time they make a change they do regression testing to ensure that they haven't broke something else with that change. Um, I did not see a lot of cases where that was there or that they provided the test cases that they used or the results from those test cases. Uh, in a, using the common criteria model, that kind of evidence would be provided to some sort of reviewer uh, to show. So going back to the assurance team trying to say, yes, you can trust this, that information isn't available, the test cases and the results from those test cases. Let me see. Vulnerability assessments. Um, really interesting topic. Uh, it's where you're looking at your design and you're saying, how can someone screw with me? And then you document how they can't screw with you based on how you thought they could screw with them. Uh, philosophy called abuse cases is uh, the one I was introduced to kind of explain this. Um, I haven't seen a lot of that kind of formality in the open source community. Um, this is to not to be uh, construed with what's going on where you have people looking for holes that they can write exploits against. That's different. Um, this is more, I'll use the term, internally driven versus someone trying to punch holes in it. Um, if folks are interested, this sounds like something that could be worked on and built into a uh, presentation for next year. The, but this is this year. So let me talk about uh, development documentation. We need to understand what is the requirement. What am I looking for? What is it, from my perspective, I represent the teams that would look at open source software and say, yeah, we can trust it. Um, and uh, so what we would be looking for is two things. One, some document that captures the design philosophy and then this uh, tracing down to the software and what tools are available. Before I start digging into that, uh, I had someone look at my presentation who was involved in a couple major open source projects and uh, gave me some insight into how not to do documentation, developer documentation. 
And so before I get into how I think it needs to be done, let me just emphasize that I'm acknowledging that there are some, uh, a lot of ways to screw this up, a lot of really painful ways. Um, individual was worked in an organization where the documentation consisted of source code comments, which was pseudocode and only the pseudocode before the actual code. It was so obvious to be useful and annoying. Um, from a paper written on IC Sharp's uh, website, uh, Bernie uh, Spaduto, I, I mispronounced the last name, um, wrote a paper in uh, 2002, which kind of amazes me, it was on how to comment your code well. Uh, I was introduced to commenting back in 1982 in my first programming class, and it just surprises me that we're still writing how to write comments well in our source code. Uh, obviously, we haven't fixed that, and that helps me manage my expectations not to expect everybody to run out and develop developer documentation tomorrow. Uh, baby steps. One of the things that he emphasizes is don't bury comments in your source code that have to do with configuration management issues uh, that says, I did this to fix this. Uh, he recommends that goes up in front so that you have a versioning control for the files. Um, it amazes me. Uh, don't include comments that address the obvious. Uh, apparently, some organizations have a real issue with this where they want everything commented. Don't, uh, this reflects an earlier comment, don't leave the design and the code out of sync. There may be times that you realize that you need to fix something that doesn't match the design. At the end of the day, they need to match. Don't wait until the end of the project where the code's written to write design documentation that explains how you ended up with what you got. <laughs> um, they need to be kind of kept in sync. Most importantly, do not assume that well-commented modular code is enough. If you're looking for your project to be survivable beyond the one or two developers that are supporting it, that is not enough. You need some more documentation so that more people can pick up and run with your solution if you can't. So what am I looking for? We need in the documentation, development documentation, to understand the flow and the purpose of what is there. It doesn't help us run the software any faster. It doesn't help us uh, configure it. This is extra documentation I'm asking for. I mean, you know, years ago they said put comments in your source code. Then they said make user guides. Well, now I'm here saying and make developer documentation. To do a security review in a cost-effective manner, which is the reason I'm here, is there needs to be traceability between the functional description, what you're wanting to do, the high-level design, and then from the high-level design down to the low-level design, which for software is essentially your source code. It is important in a document other than the source code to capture your design philosophy. We need an overall architecture, pictures are nice, um, and some sort of explanation for why subsystems are there, why modules are there, um, why they're called, uh, and without having to go through the source code and understand that. Let us understand what we, let us develop some expectations up front, and then as we go through, we'll understand what's written there. Um, and as I said earlier, developing alternatives considered is a beneficial, is benefit to the developer community more than the assurance community. Um, also, and this uh, is significant in the comments in the source code, is if you're doing uh, protection, like balance checking, make sure that comments in the source code. Um, and then there are some tools that can highlight that. Um, what are some of the tools that are available for creating developer documentation? Uh, obviously, some of the easiest one are text. Uh, on the Mozilla site, they have a, uh, essentially a white paper that describes the design. That is an effort. You may not have the desire, the inclination, the writing skills, whatever term you want to use to produce a document like that. Um, what I think we need to focus on is the source code comments and especially um, uh, using, making source code comments that a parser will recognize that will be able to pull those comments out and put them in a separate document. So you're having your documentation in one file and then if someone wants to dig in, they can see that in the source code in another file. Uh, flow charts for uh, certain programs. Um, UML diagrams, I have uh, three types of them listed here. Uh, you know, what are your classes that you're using? Um, how are they called? What's the sequence? And how do they interact? And then for some unusual, I don't know if it's, 
I, I couldn't find a case, but this is a uh, type of design documentation. Finite state machines and state charts, they're uh, somewhat related um, for uh, some very specific cases. Uh, I've seen people describe that as a technique to show error cases. Um, but for an overall software, and the uh, major design document, that's probably heavy uh, for most solutions. This is an example of a picture. Uh, that would help someone begin to understand what the code is doing. This comes from one of the earlier versions of Password Safe. Uh, it, this uh, picture w is in a document that was written by Andrew, Mull Andrew Mulligan while he was in graduate school. Um, and the good news is he's now a developer on the Password Safe project, uh, which is, I think, the, the perfect situation. Um, and he goes through and comments and says that uh, what you see here is a design that basically keys events off a, a GUI and, you know, although this might be good for initial, it's not good for a long-term solution. And for those who use password safe, you probably saw a big difference uh, recently when they went to the new version. Um, and those included his changes. I don't want to get into changing the design of the software. What I want to do is show this is an example of a picture that lets me know what are the pieces I would expect and how do they interact. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not the devil's advocate. <laughs> I'm actually here to defend the devil's advocate. I talked to a developer in the commercial industry about this issue uh, who agreed, you know, software development is software development. We have the same problems. We just have the ability to choose different ways to solve it. And he made the argument that commercial developers are going to solve it first. And I want to try to counter some of that. Actually, I'm going to counter two out of three at least. Um, he emphasizes that the commercial developers are market driven to develop the code correctly. Um, there is an, a, a grain of truth to that, but there is a body of evidence to show that suggest otherwise. Um, the, in the market, you have people's salary, uh, professional reputations uh, may come into play. Um, but in general, uh, the market pace is not driven by technical. Um, in the open source community, the pressure is entirely reputation. You publish crap, people will recognize it for crap. Um, and so if there's a hole, your ability to fix that is going to convey to people confidence in whether they can use it. Um, so. I think that the open source community is just as capable, maybe more capable, um, to develop code correctly. Second, uh, if you're paying for software, you have certain demands for reliability. Um, I can't explain it, but I believe those same demands for reliability exist in the open source community, because I see the projects being developed increase reliability, increase stability. There has to be some motive there, and it's us. Um, we are demanding that reliability. And it's, the money is one thing, but I see the, our ability to influence the um, development and increase the reliability is uh, an even match between the closed source and open source. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's okay. Um, and the last is one that I don't know if I can argue, and that's the requirement to make the code approachable. Um, if you dig down in the file that's on your CD, you'll see the actual language used, which <laughs> um, I may be cleaned up a bit. But essentially, you know, everybody has their own perspective. If you're the one person developer on a piece of software, your perspective may be you don't understand why everybody else doesn't understand it or doesn't understand how to use it. Um, and therefore, when someone says, you need to make your software more approachable so that we can look at it, maybe use it, um, you may be resistant to that. 
Um, the uh, obviously that's personality dependent, and uh, um, I don't know if the commercial world has an advantage other than the market forces to be able to keep their software updated to uh, make their code any more approachable than we do. Path ahead. Um, what I see happening is uh, for the larger projects or more significant projects, they are doing more developer documentation. They have bought into the concept that for the project to survive, we need to capture why that code is there. Um, the OpenSSL project is actually a special example for me. Um, for those who uh, support cryptography in the, the government, you may have heard of FIPS 140. It's basically an evaluation program or validation program, excuse me, that allows the use of crypt uh, cryptographic items. Um, OpenSSL would be the first open source solution validated and validated source code level as opposed to the binary level. I mean, this is huge because now you're not having to validate every different version that's compiled, um, which is what we had to do in the past or what uh, the, the people representing projects had to do in the past. Um, if you go to the OpenSSL website, you'll see the effort that they've had to undergo to go through that process. It, it's not trivial, but it's, it, it is not trivial for an open source project. It is uh, a lot easier to support if you're in the commercial world because you can have the marketing person say, I can't sell this to the government until it's validated. And then the price tag isn't that high of a barrier. It's not like a common criteria evaluation where you're talking five to an order of magnitude higher in the cost between a FIPS 140 and a, a common criteria evaluation. Um, okay. um, in general, I think there is improved comments in the source code. I, I know I made that comment earlier about, you know, we're still trying to teach it 20 years later. I think we'll continually teach it because we have new students. Um, I think we may need to look at how we uh, peer review those comments and that's handled differently within projects. You know, they're, they're human dynamics. Every team is different. Um, I think that if we're going to develop developer documentation, the focus needs to be, as I said, let me back up a second. When I talked about development documentation, I talked about traceability from the top down. Let's talk about a high level functional description, then our high level design, then the low level design and the implementation. Um, I don't think that uh, we can go out and do it that way, top down. That's my opinion, and I'm <laughs> more than, I would welcome it to be challenged, actually. I think that what we need to do is work actually from the bottom up, so that we, if we start from the top down, we actually have a place to land. Um, and so the focus needs to be on making the comments in the source code that reflect the design decisions. Um, and the reason is, that's where we're working now. We're in the code now. I'm not, you're, you're not asking for a new document. I'm just asking to improve the documents that exist now. The other thing is, the tools are available now to help document what's in the source code, the source code to parse through the source code. Java Docs is uh, the, the, the example that I was introduced to. Um, is able to pull that up and pull it together. Um, and so we're not having to talk about wrestling with uh, some sort of drawing program to create UML diagrams. Uh, you know, it, it's relatively straightforward. Learn a few tags and all of a sudden you can create a set of documentation uh, without a significant increase in effort. Um, and as I said, I think the uh, effort needs to be driven from the bottom up. Kind of wrap things up. Um, what I don't know. I don't know how to motivate the folks who are developing code to write more documentation. Um, I mean, I've heard the arguments before, you know, you're, you're the, the, we're commenting the source code, now we're having to create a user guide, and now you want me to create a document that no one but me is going to use. Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> I do, I want that, but I don't know how to motivate people to say that. Um, if, you're, if the software is a security solution, like password safe, so, if someone may need to have some degree of confidence in it, it's more important than some other solutions, at least to me, that's my bias, of course. The other thing, and this is a, an important issue, is I don't know how much documentation is enough. I also think the commercial world has that problem. Um, but I do have a theory on how to determine how much is enough. 
um, and I'll get to that last. What I do know, tools are available. They vary by quality. Uh, they vary by ease of use. Um, but in general, if they, you know, as with all things, people start using, they provide comment, and uh, the tools will improve to what we need. I believe this community is going to solve the problem better than the commercial world, and that the lessons from this community will actually uh, be brought into the commercial world as best as they can. So I think it's our opportunity to direct uh, different ways of handling it back. Um, and, and the advantage we have is, of course, is the open, uh, that's the significant piece, exchange of information. Um, we're able to say, you know, this is a bad design, and someone says, okay, it's stunk. Um, and we're able to move on from that point. It's different than a propriety, proprietary development environment where that may be a closed community um, and it, it, that conversation doesn't live beyond that moment. Um, feedback priorities, that deals with how much documentation is too much. As I said, there's two communities that can benefit from the development documentation. It's development team themselves and then assessment groups. So how much documentation and enough is enough the way I would determine that is what does the team need? What can the team benefit from? And the view that you have to have is if we wanted to accelerate bringing someone on board to help, to bring someone onto the team. The second piece is if your solution is being looked at, um, incorporating some of those lessons learned from you know, somebody conducting some sort of assurance review um, you know, uh, and letting that kind of guide what is enough. Um, I certainly think that uh, what Common Criteria is looking for uh, is, is heavy um, and uh, prohibitively so in a lot of cases. And so w we need to be able to, I'll use the term experiment, find out what works and what doesn't, and then share those lessons learned. Okay. Um, I'll open the floor to questions. Yes? Uh, do you have any comments uh, or impressions on the uh, open DSP audit center? Uh, no, uh, I mean I'm aware of it somewhat, but I have not. I'm not current. My my education isn't current, so I don't want to uh, say the wrong thing, which <laughs> I could. Yes. I was wondering Okay. Um, let, me, let me summarize your question and see if I got it correctly. And that's basically what's my intent with this development documentation? And that goes back to um, the development of what uh, the term I was taught was abuse cases and how to refute those. Um, in the example with Derek's boot and new D-band, it's possible that someone could write a utility that rather than wiping the disk, they actually encrypt the information with their key or some way to hide the key. So that if you, all you're doing is when you're done wiping, you verify that it's just garbage on the disk, the encrypted traffic would look like garbage. Um, and then you know somebody waits at the uh, um, sales where they're getting rid of defense equipment or government equipment or healthcare equipment, and then buys up the hard disks and see if they have some information on it. You get one of the uh, Simpson Garfinkel papers written again. Um, so what I would look at is how do I know that it's actually wiping it versus then reading, encrypting, and then writing it back down? And so I look at the developer documentation, I find out where that process should be, and then I go and look at it and see how it's executed. So I'm not having to look at the whole code. I mean, D-Band's a wonderful example for this because the piece that, that is really D-Band is really small, but it sits on top of a bootable CD or a bootable floppy. And so if someone hasn't looked at the software that makes up that bootable floppy or bootable CD, guess what? Everything is in scope. You have to look, you have to follow it through, and there, at that point, and still is, no development documentation to guide you down the path to verify that. Um, yes? Yes. Um, have, have there been any objective studies of the relative uh, likelihood of vulnerabilities being exploited on uh, commercial software? I don't know 
Um, let me repeat the question. Has there been a study of the um, uh, open source versus proprietary software and the ability to exploit uh, the different versions? You know, is there a different rate? Or how they're exploited, I guess is more correctly. Or how frequent, okay. How frequently vulnerabilities are exploited is the metric and you're comparing um, open source versus uh, proprietary software. And um, I'm not familiar, I can't pull up a, a study off the top of my head. Yes, please. Yeah, just, that'd be funny. This all sounds good and understand the practical sort of sense. Just given the owners why I've never come in and code is just so that I don't, you know, it comes down the line, I don't know why I did that, but Um, the, the thing that has to be looked at, I, I understand that. That was exactly the impression given to me by the um, one individual who had uh, reviewed uh, my presentation before I came here was, you know, well-commented code is enough. Um, that's all you ever need. And <laughs> all I can say is um, people who have done a lot more software development uh, have written that if you don't have that design captured and the comments aren't in the source code so folks can understand that when you have to go back and fix something, you will spend longer fixing it um, than you will have if you had written the documentation in the first place. And, I mean, that, that's the real advantage. You have to, be, I mean, you may have to run into those situations where it's a teaching point. You had a hard time fixing that, didn't you? Well, it might have been easier if we had the documentation in the first place. <laughs> um, answer with, with a, a point is that in the open source community there is no QA group that would prevent you from publishing. I mean I, I actually look at that as an advantage. Um, the, uh, if we had that as a separate process then all of a sudden you can say okay that's great. If people who are looking at code and reviewing it, I'm not just talking about finding uh, exploitable vulnerabilities but actually doing a review that uh, is somewhat comprehensive were to publish that um, and make that more open that would be great. Um, there was an attempt to try to create that. Um, I don't have my notes with me. Um, and that effort, oh boy, I can't remember the name of it. All right. No. <laughs> Let me do, okay, I can't remember the name. There was a website that was going to collect vulnerability assessments, reviews of software. And essentially what happened was they shut it down because they couldn't get funding. They couldn't get funding because the only people writing reviews were a few graduate students of one professor at one university. Um, we're, not, we're obviously not ready for that. Otherwise, it would have happened. So, and I don't know how to get to that point. Um, but that would be really nice is to have a body of documentation of people who are looking at code uh, comprehensively and saying, this is what I looked at and these are the results. Uh, yes?
Um, having a solution like that would do wonders, um, but that's going to apply for the things that would get bundled um, with an operating system, and that, that's the only limitation. But I think that's a, a good concept um, for that. Yes? Okay, and I, what we may want to do is uh, revisit at least my impression of an earlier situation, and that's with user guides. Um, a lot of programmers out there, when it comes to explaining how to use uh, their software, the English skills, they're not as well as their coding skills. I guess that's the right way to say it. <laughs> is, that, is that play enough? Um, and so what happened? Um, we didn't stop writing user guides. We found people in the community whose skill was English who would work with this programmer and translate it. Well, maybe what we need to do is open up and say, is, you know, are there people out there who aren't necessarily programmers but might do um, you know, more focus on vulnerability assessments, on architecture, on uh, just general discussions, uh, you know, open up the body larger than just being a programmer. You don't need to come, you know, you don't need to have some sort of programmer badge to participate. Um, and and th there are no bars that I saw. I mean, there's a lot of projects out there when you go through SourceForge where you'll see team members and their roles are identified. You know, some of them, you know, pro you know program manager or project manager. You got developers. You have documentation. You got test specialists. Um, lots of people have different labels. Uh, this may need to be another label. Um, this may be something where we have some people try and then just open it up and say, hey, comment on this. Find, you know, find people who have experience. Uh, doing this documentation and saying, how does this work? Um, yes? All right, so in terms of using documentation to verify a program, what happens if the developer develops uh, comments one way and the developer another? Okay, um, let me go back to my methodology, which is I'm going to develop what I call an abuse case and say, this is what I think the program could do. And then what I have to do is go through the design documentation, which really just aims my review. And then the end result is I'm going to look in the source code and make sure that it's actually implementing what it claimed to implement. Um, and the quality of that review is obviously going to vary by the skill of the reviewer. Um, my expertise is at the higher level, developing the abuse cases, not at the lower level. You know, is this pro you know, were there any holes in how this was programmed? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, that's good. The other site that gave me a tremendous list of tools is a tool called Doxygen. Um, they have a list on that website of both the uh, non-commercial and commercial tools. Um, as I said, I, I'm convinced that the tools are there uh, for the beginning, the beginning steps. But uh, obviously, we need more practice working with it um, as a refinement. Uh, one last, one last question. Okay. I'm getting ready to get kicked off the sh uh, stage. Let me make a shameless plug for Geekwares. If you like this t-shirt, $10 in the vendor area. <laughs> the vendor area is going to be closing at 3, so if you have any final purchases to make, please do so before 3 o'clock. I'm also going to be a reminder that the DevCon surveys will happen in this room at 4 o'clock with no we need everybody to exit the room to my right. We do not have people exiting that way as we have a very long queue for the next presentation.
And so if you'd like to see the next presentation, we're asking that you uh, exit. Also, I, I spoke incorrectly about the Credit Card Networks talk and I'm typing on next. That talk, or... Okay, now that talk is at 3 o'clock. The Credit Card Networks talk is going on. So, I, I said it wasn't. I said it was being replaced. I was incorrect.